<laughs> okay, everybody can see me and it's it's going. Um, so I just want to say thank you for um, involving me today. This is uh, such a pleasure to get to hear all about the um, the uh, white snake woman in uh, China, and I'm looking forward to everything in this afternoon. It's going to be fabulous. Um, my job today is very simple. I'm just supposed to give you an overview of the various versions of the Dojoji story from its beginnings in the didactic medieval setsua aimed at young priests, um, warning them of the dangers of too close association with women in their, on their pilgrimages, through the no version, um, a dramatic battle between the forces of Buddhism and the demonic feminine. And I'm not going to address the Edo uh, period Kabuki play Musume Dojoji because um, uh, Professor Shimazaki is going to be doing that. Um, and I, but I am going to end up with a little bit of ukiyo-e woodblock prints, um, at least to get us into the Edo period visualization. Um, and I'm not going to talk about Kimazai Sadashima Daiyari um, today, because um, I just don't have enough time. So let's get started. Um, see if it goes. Yes. Um, so we, I'm going to start by talking about the Dojoji Setsua, the didactic tales. Um, it's the earliest versions of the Dojoji story appear in two Setsua collections. Um, the Miraculous Tales of the Lotus Sutra from Japan, um, uh, which is dated to around uh, 1040-43, and then Konjaku Monogatari Shu, um, or Tales of Times Now Past, um, how a monk of Dojoji in Qi province copied the Lotus Sutra and brought salvation to ser serpents. And again, that's tentatively dated to around 1120, the text is to me. Um, and then a little bit, uh, sometime around in the, in the 16th century, they develops an illustrated version of the story Dojoji Engi Emaki, um, illustrated scroll version. Um, and the story as it is related today, for example, in Eitoki performances at the Dojoji Temple in Wakayama Prefecture is based on this illustrated Emaki. So here is a, a picture of um, the story being told at Dojoji Temple. You can see here's the, on the, up here is the, um, the bell that's used in the no play. This is a, a, a um, reconstruction of the bell um, as it would have been in the temple. Um, and, and you can see the scroll and people sitting and listening to the scroll, scroll being told. Um, one point to make about the, uh, it's just a general a point, is that um, in the earliest versions, neither the man nor the woman are actually named. Um, this is often common in, um, in early setsuba. Um, the woman is just yamome, a single woman, um, usually understood as a young widow. Um, and then there's, but there's a slightly later version, Genko Shakusho in 1332, that for the first time includes the man's name, Anchin. And then a little bit later in the Muromachi, we get the woman's name, Kiyohime, um, in the Kengaku no Soshi. And from that point on, which I should go back, from that point on, basically all the versions refer to them by Anchin and Kiyohime to the, story, to the point that it's just told, presented as the story of Anchin and Kiyohime. Um, another thing I would say is that there's one point major difference between the Setsuwa versions and the Emaki um, illustrated scroll version is that the early Setsuwa have the woman dying and trans drying after, after she feel, realizes that she's been rejected by the man and transforming into a 40 foot long serpent in her bedchamber and then emerging from the bedchamber and chasing after him as the serpent. Um, the illustrated scroll versions and all the versions from the time of the Dojoji Enge, Enge Emaki onwards have her transforming as she chases after the priest along the road. And it makes sense because it's a much more dramatic, and especially if you're unscrolling the emakimono, um, if you're telling the story that way, it's much more dramatic, as you'll see, to see her transform um, along the way. Um, so the basic story. Um, we Oh, shoot, I didn't set my timer. Well, I guess we'll just have to, we'll start now. <laughs> The two, there are two monks on the pilgrimage to the Kamano Shugendo complex. Um, one's rather elderly, the other is young and quite good looking. Um, the two stop for the night at the home of a young widow whose lustful desires are deeply aroused by the handsome young monk. Um, in the middle of the night, she sneaks into his room and tries to get him to sleep with her by embracing, teasing, and fondling him. So, um, and here we have, oops, here we have, um, the woman approaching the two monks um, uh, and inviting them to stay uh, at her home. The elderly monk is not really shown, but you can see what a good looking guy <laughs> the young monk is. Um, it's not completely clear whether they've asked her for a night's lodging or she's uh, um, importuning them. Um, and then in the next, um, up here, uh, we have her, um, 
uh, this is the scene where she tries to seduce him. He doesn't look at unhappy in this picture. <laughs> it's, you can't quite see what her expression is, but um, but in here he's uh, he says no no no. Um, I, I have to stay pure for my um, pilgrimage to Kumano, but I, I promise I will come right back afterwards. Um, and here we say him saying, why should I just, why would I deceive you? I, I promise to come back. Um, but of course, and she says, you promise you're, you're going to come back. Um, but on the way home, he takes a different path um, and avoids her house entirely. And this sets up uh, the, the subsequent anger and transfaith mission. Um, one of the things about the Emakimono is Kumano is to the right, Dojoji is to the left. Um, so when uh, when she starts running towards, Do he starts running and she starts running towards Dojoji, they're going um, to the left and all the pilgrims that she runs into are going to the right. And it, this is how it unscrolls. So it's, that's as, it, it makes sense. But um, oh, it won't turn, go. Oh, it stopped going. What's going on? There it goes. Um, so he's gone a different way. And at a certain point on the day, he's given her a day that he was supposed to come back. She realizes that he's deceived her. She starts giving chase. Um, we have a couple of uh, scenes where she actually interacts with the, um, the pilgrims along the way, asking them if they've seen them. They all say, well, I think he went that way. Um, and here she started to become increasingly disheveled. Um, she loses a sandal. This is a, a, the first sign of her increasingly distraught mental state. Earlier on, she had her um, scarf over her head, her hood over her head. Now it's she's fully visible. Um, another thing to think about in terms of the makimono is that she um, is that she's actually addressing him, but then as a, as the scroll on uh, on scrolls, um, he is actually looking back at her and making a comment um, on her as she passes him. So this is how this works. Here she is when she loses the, sal sa the sandal. How maddening this is. Every moment that I'm unable to get my hands on that low down priest, my heart knows no rest. In normal circumstances, the shame of all this would be mortifying to me, but now let my sandals and my scandals fall where they may. Duranashiya sandals and omote nashiya scandals. And that's the translation from Ginny Scored Waters. Um, I'll give that uh, reference later. Um, so here she is, uh, she's catching up to him and we get his look, he's terrified looking back at her. She's got her hands reaching out to get to him. Her hair is flowing in the wind at this point. Um, now <laughs> she's actually got, seems to have gotten larger, um, but her head is starting to uh, turn more into a serpent. It's almost like she's flying with her hands out on either side. He started losing his, uh, all of his stuff, um, his, his backpack and, and various uh, Buddhist accoutrements. Um, now we have her with uh, a, a serpent head, right? She still has some nice looking legs there bending along, but, and, and she's starting to breathe fire. Um, now they get to, she gets to the banks of the Hidakagawa River, the Hidaka River, um, and the ferryman has already uh, been bribed by the monk not to take her across the river. So he refuses to take her. And she runs back and forth along the, the riverbank trying to decide what she to do. But finally she decides she has no choice. She takes off her clothing and, and drops a robe and dives in. And this is in this uh, version of the story, this is when her transformation is complete. Um, so now we see she's, she's a full serpent uh, swimming through the river. Now other versions of the illustrated scroll, uh, scroll have her um, continuing to transform as she goes into the water. So here's another version of her. Um, uh, and here it, she still, she has feet still, um, the, the fire coming off of her. Um, and notice that her head is, uh, is human still. She's, it's, this is really like a Hanya mask, which we'll see soon, um, with the horns. And, but the, but the, it's a slightly different version of her embodiment um, here. Meanwhile, the monks at the Dojoji temple are hiding, hiding the terrified monk under the bell. And you can see here, they, are, they don't really, the expressions of the, um, of the monks, they are not that, they don't seem very worried. They think it's a kind of a big joke. And, um, and he's trying to convince them to do this. He's, and he actually repeats the same thing he said to the woman. Why would I deceive you? <laughs> Maybe a little more urgently. There really is the serpent woman coming after me. Um, and so they, they figure out to, to put him under, under the bell in the hopes that this is going to actually stop the, the serpent. But when the serpent arrives at the temple, 
um, she, you know, goes out, slithers over the gate, and she goes all the way through the temple until she gets to the hall where the um, the the bell has been uh, hidden and, and lowered over the monk. She batters down the, the hall door um, and, and bursts in and then looks at the, the bell and realizes, of course, he's got to be under there. Um, and so she wraps herself around the bell. She grabs a hold of the dragon headed boss um, at the top. She wraps her body around it and she lashes it um, for five to six hours until it turns red hot. And then, and then she slithers back to the Hidaka River. Her job is done. Her, her job of revenge is done. Um, afterwards, the monk look at the bell and find only, finding only a blackened skeleton, like charcoal here. And now they're all very upset and, uh, um, and realize that, that uh, this really, you, it really was a serious problem. Um, later, a senior priest of the temple has a dream in which the two appear as serpents. And so here's the two of them down here, uh, sort of entangled in each other. Um, the male, uh, the, the monk as a serpent explains he's been reborn into this vile, filthy body as the husband of the evil woman serpent. And he begs the priest to copy out the Lotus Sutra, the limitless life of the Tathagata to release both of them from their suffering. And then we can see the, um, the, the, uh, the monk copying the chapter here on the left. Um, now the completed chapter is being ritually dedicated. Here it is on the, um, and, um, and of course the two return in a dream to thank him. Um, thanks to the power of the Lotus Sutra, we have shed our serpentine bodies. I'm in the Tory heaven and he, this now it's the woman serpent speaking. Um, I'm in the Tory heaven and he's been reborn in the Tosotsu heaven. So they've gone to separate heavens, right? The one for the males and one for females. Um, and they then parted from each other and seemed to fade off into the empty heavens. Um, so, uh, and then the Kondraka Monogatari Shu ends here with, um, you see, therefore, the strength of evil in the female heart. It is for this reason that the Buddha strictly forbids approaching women, know this and avoid them. Um, and if you, uh, you know, if you've read my article on um, one of the two versions I have of, on, on the Dojoji story, um, it's, pre it's pretty clear that this original story was written um, to try to warn young monks um, to avoid women on their pilgrimages, right? It was this sort of over the top story that's specifically targeted at them. And I, I timed this and I don't really have a lot of time to talk about the Kigon Eggi version um, of the story, but just to say that there is um, that really in, um, in response to this extremely negative uh, portrayal of women um, within uh, Japanese Buddhism, which is supposed to, supposed to be egalitarian, though we know all know on the ground it wasn't at all. Um, there's a, an alternative version of female monstrosity that develops um, in the Kegon Engi. Um, and uh, basically you have exactly the same story, but it's set um, in, uh, in China. Um, and uh, instead of turning into a horrible uh, vengeful demon, the, um, the uh, woman turns into this wonderful dragon who is carrying her, uh, her priest back to China safely. So if, you know, it just shows you that, um, now we know that Kegon Engi was, uh, um, Karen Brock wrote a whole book on this, um, was written for wealthy lay women who are being encouraged to support Buddhism. So you get to be a powerful female dragon if you're subordinated to Buddhism, you know, but where's the fun in that? There's no fun in that. <laughs> Um, so now the no dojoji. Um, one point <clears throat> about this is that um, the major backstory, there's a major backstory change um, uh, often used in the no. The lustful wid young wid widow becomes the innocent young daughter of a local innkeeper. Um, her father has teased her that when she grows up, she'll be the wife of a handsome priest who comes to visit once a year for the Kumano pilgrimage. Um, they say part of the story is that he brings her a toy every year, so she becomes very attached to him. Um, when she turns about 14 or 15, now she's marriageable age. Um, she's tired of waiting, so she sneaks into his room to ask if this year is going to be the year that he will take her away to be his wife. And in the other, as in the other versions, the monk prevaricates and avoids coming back by her home, leading to her transformation into a fire-breathing serpent bent on revenge. And as we'll see, the, these two versions of the story um, will have uh, rather different effects in terms of the costuming. And I'm, I, I, I'm pretty sure Carol will also be pointing this out 
but I'm just sort of setting you up to watch the, the no video and pointing out places that are sort of interesting that then you'll get to see um, when my, when my uh, introduction is done. Okay. Um, so, oh, I'm gonna have a, a little bit of a, an introduction here. Um, Dojoji involves two of the most exciting and difficult performance elements in no, the Rambyoshi, disordered rhythm dance, and the Kaneiri, the bell entering scene. In the Iri Rambyoshi, the serpent woman, disguised as a beautiful Shirabyoshi dancer and entertainer, entrances the low ranking temple workers who guard the temple bell that's the object of her passionate attachment. So she's come back to attack the bell that, um, that she is, is obsessing about. As the Shirabyoshi, the shite actor circles slowly and continuously, stamping out a rhythm accented by a single shoulder drum, a kotsutsumi, and embellished by occasional flute melody and also kakegoe. Um, there's long drawn out sil silences abruptly pierced by the drummer's high-pitched cries. That's the kakegoe. Um, this all adds to the atmosphere of unbearable tension, which builds inexorably to the climax of the play, the show-stopping kaneiri. The woman having lulled everyone to sleep with her hypnotic dance, seizes her chance to attack the huge bell, which hangs suspended over the stage. Moving directly underneath it, neath it, she suddenly leaps up into the bell as it comes crashing to the ground. If done correctly, this dangerous leap, and it is dangerous, we'll talk about that, gives the impression that the dancer has vanished right before one's very eyes. The actor then has to change costume into the demonic serpent woman inside the bell. So this is a major, uh, it's a very difficult costume change. Um, because of the physical and mental demands made on the actor by these two scenes, performing dojoji is considered a kind of test, which actors in their late 20s, early 30s, depending on where their ranking is in, the, in their school, uh, must pass in order to make, take their places as fully qualified master actors. And then after that, they're allowed to be performing in the monthly school performances as main day actors. Um, and uh, just a, a note about the danger of the, the kaneiri leap. Um, uh, oh, actually, I'll say that in a moment. First, just looking at this, in some versions of the play, before the play begins, the bell is carried in and hung up. Um, in others, the bell's already hanging when the audience enters. I have seen performances at Dojoji where they had some trouble getting the bell through, <laughs> through, the, through the, um, the anchor at the top. So uh, it's, it, it can be a little tricky. Um, and here we have it, it's, it's, it's managed to get it up. And I just to say, these are all from uh, um, um, photographs from, uh, not all of them, but most of them are uh, performances of December 1980 of Izumi Yoshio from the Globe Pad. Um, site, which is not working very well nowadays, but that's where I got them. Um, so just noting how many stage assistants we need to, pull that, to keep that bell uh, up. It's usually five to six of them over here. Um, and although covered in silk, it is weighted with lead around the bottom so that it falls you know, heavily. And so it's quite heavy. And really, um, it is a dangerous thing. There's, uh, if you mistime your leap and hit the top of that bell, um, you can break your neck. Um, in 1994, uh, um, a, an amateur performer broke her neck. Um, and the same year, a couple months before I got there, um, a, a pretty senior Kita uh, actor who was in his 40s managed to crack his neck. Um, and he didn't realize that he'd cracked his neck and went on and did the entire performance. But, you know, Monday morning, he was like, huh? And he went in and they had him in traction for something like four months. So you really can't hurt yourself if you mistime this jump. Um, and it's one of, it's, it's just, and that's one of the things where people are just, oh, another thing is, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this, but when the bell falls, they immediately pull it up for about two inches. And then the actor has to spin it from inside so that they know that the actor is okay. That's like one of the things that they do just to make sure. Okay. Um, so after everything's set up, um, the, uh, the, just the setting of the, of the play is at the Dojoji Temple. The time is many years after the events um, narrated in the Setsua. Um, in Dojoji, uh, it, um, the, the exact date is left unspecified, but it seems clear from the, um, that the original events are no longer in any living person's memory, right? Since only the head priest knows the story. 
Um, so the plan is to reinstate the bell with the reading of the Lotus Sutra and the head priest for reasons best known to himself has forbidden women entrance to the story, to the entrance to the, um, uh, to the service, excuse me. Um, so uh, this day, um, a, a Shirobyoshi dancer arrives from the province of Ki um, and she requests admittance so that she can uh, perform a purification dance for the uh, for the bell. Now, Shirobyoshi were popular entertainers and occasional religious fellowships of the late Han, early Kamakura period. They were known for dancing in male attire, right? They took their name white rhythmic stamping from the fact that they wore the white silk robe of a court aristocrat along with his a uh, black lacquered court cap and a short sword. And here's an illustration from Tale of Heike. You can see the black court cap. She's wearing the, um, uh, a dancing cloak. Oftentimes they also performed with a sword. Um, so it's particularly significant that the um, stay here appears dressed as a man because uh, that's the argument she makes. That is not, she's not an ordinary woman and therefore she should be allowed to, to enter the temple grounds. And one of the arguments that I make in the Dojoji story is that this doubling, and this actually comes up again and again later on in various versions of the Dojoji in the Edo period as well, but that this double gendering, a woman performing as a man, um, allows both the, the priests sort of subliminally also to be participating in this. Um, in this. Um, so this, the low ranking, uh, um, the low ranking temple worker here, um, charmed by the shield of Yushi's, Yoshi's beauty, disarmed by her argument, and most of all, desirous of seeing her dance, right? Make, takes it upon himself to let her in and offers her the dancing cap. So um, now, uh, before we get to that part, just to say, again, we have the two costume interpretations, right? If we are arguing that, that if not if you're arguing, if you're using the backstory that it's the young widow on the left-hand side, we have this much uh, darker, um, uh, more sober kind of a, a, a um, top robe. Um, and the face also is of a slightly older woman, um, uh, but she has the uh, triangles underneath that indicate that that's her uh, true serpent nature. So they should have figured it out. And she also is wearing the karmic wheels on her um, lower robe, um, which is uh, a sheer indication, <laughs> sure, sure indication that you're going to be uh, demonic. Um, same uh, robe at the below that's being is used in Aoi no Way with for Rokujo, for example. Over here on the right, we have the young girl, of course, dressed in much brighter red uh, costume, and she has a, a, a cool multi mask, right? So uh, much less, uh, it's just much friendlier and happier and younger and sweeter. Right? Um, and this will in fact have an effect on what the demon looks like, um, the serpent woman looks like when she comes out from underneath the bell. So just setting that up. Um, uh, so here we have uh, the temple servant has given her the hat, um, court cap, and she begins to perform the danbyoshi. And we're seeing this here um, that she's, uh, she's stepping. I mean the, the 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 step, and we're going to see that in the in the performance. So I don't have to talk too much about that. Um, but her slow circling and stamping dance um, hypnotizes the temple workers, basically puts them to sleep. Um, and it also uh, it's been argued that the circling represents her stealthy climb up the belfry tower steps, so she'll be in a position to attack the bell. Um, the stamps of the dance are very carefully synchronized with the shoulder drum, and here you can see. Um, that the shoulder drum player is actually a, a very unusually angled um, so that he can uh, see has, has a really good view of her and can make sure that the um, that the uh, that her feet uh, that his that they're in synchronization and that's uh, there's only two things no plays are very rarely um, rehearsed but in dojoji the two things that are re rehearsed are the rambyoshi and the kani iri right um, so at the end of the Rambyoshi, there's a sudden change to a furiously paced Kyunomai dance, a fast dance. At the climax, the state turns and points to the bell. Up to the bell, she stealthily creeps, pretending to go on with her dance. She holds her fan and looks at the bell. She starts to strike it. She swings the fan back and forth like a bell hammer. This loathsome bell, now I remember it. This is Donald Keene's translation. 
So here she is pointing at the bell, this, that Wilson bell, now I remember it. Now notice over here on the right, people are getting ready for the Kanaidi and they are, they have, uh, before it's been tied up here, they don't hold it the entire time. But when they get to this point, they loosen it um, and they're, they're holding it in, uh, to get ready for the, for the jump. Um, there are quite a number of stage assistants you can see over here. This is an unusually, uh, Dojo uses an unusually large number of stage assistants because of the complicated, just how complex it is. Um, so, um, <clears throat> but instead of uh, striking the bell, she loosens the strings of her dancing cap and she knocks it from her head with a blow from her fan. Um, and the, the fan, the, the carrot cap usually goes skidding across the stage and the uh, stage assistant has to get out there really fast and get it um, out of her way so that she doesn't trip her. Something happened with it. Um, moving directly beneath the bell, the actor positions their hands touching the rim. And in some schools, they touch forward. Um, in the two visions, uh, the two images we're going to see, they're touching, they're holding their hands out to the right and left. <clears throat> and then they do a series of stamps to coordinate with the stage assistants in timing the release of the bell as the actor leaps upward. Um, and as I said, if done correctly, this dangerous leap gives the impression that the dancer has vanished right before our eyes. So here uh, we see um, the, uh, the actor holding their hands up on either side. This is a, a young woman. Um, uh, the hat is right here. This guy is, is heading over there to try to get it. Um, before uh, before the bell comes down. Um, and this is a, sorry, go back. Um, again, positioning right prior to the leap, note that this is uh, the older woman um, uh, costume. Um, so the, the chorus sings right before she jumps, placing her hand on the dragon head boss. She seems to fly upward into the bell. She wraps the bells around her, she has disappeared. Um, and then there's a lot of stage action, right? We have the, um, which is important because it allows the actor inside the bell to time to change their costume, right? And it's a complete change of costume or actually for one version it's more for one than the other and we'll see that. The temple servants react, what happened, what happened? And you know, the bell is blazing hot. And then they have a, an argument back and forth between the two temple servants who's going to tell the head priest and one of the, other, one of the temple servants runs off and the other one is left to go tell the, the, um, the priest that uh, the bell has fallen. But really, it's not our fault. But oh, yeah, there was this woman. <laughs> and uh, so the priest immediately realizes that the serpent woman has come back to attack the bell. So now he, now he explains the backstory of Dojoji and tells everyone this must be the serpent woman returned. Um, the priests take out their prayer beads and begin to recite the mantra of Fudo, the immovable one. Um, and then their prayer causes the bell to rise and then the serpent woman is revealed. So um, here are two versions of the serpent woman revealed in the second half. There's a uh, the young woman on the left and the older uh, widow on the right. Um, you can see that uh, this is a much more dramatic costume with the big red wig. Um, the long red hakama pants, which are uh, split pants, which are also, um, uh, which very definitely uh, indicate her serpent nature, but are much harder to move in on stage. Um, and, uh, and also there's a demon stick, of course, over here. Um, <clears throat> um, because this, uh, uh, we'll see that also there's differences in the mask, the Shinja mask versus the Hanya mask. Um, so this is a, a much more horrific version of the demon, much scarier version of the demon woman. Um, and, uh, and so, and, and interestingly, it's uh, the young girl, the innocent young girl who we would be much more sympathetic with, um, turns into a much more horrific demon in the second half. This is the, uh, the widow over here. The hair is much, they don't have to do much with the hair. Um, the, 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 they just have to take the outer robe down and fold, this back and fold it back. And so the costume change here is much simpler. And so general, it's not com completely true, but the choice to choose the more difficult costume change and the more difficult um, uh, uh, pants, um, oftentimes younger actors doing the dojoji for the first time will choose to do the easier version. So it's not necessarily that they think, oh, I think she's a young woman or, oh, I think she's a young widow. It's very much based on pragmatics. Um, so um, this is just to show you the differences in the masks. This is the, the, the young widow mask, the Hanya mask, which is also used for 
um, Aoi no Wei, for example, it has a, a kind of sadness to it. Um, it's not com completely demonic at all. Um, and here's the Shinja mask, which is <laughs> definitely a whole lot scarier, right? So this is the true serpent mask, much, much more terrifying. Wouldn't want to meet that in, in a dark alley. Um, when she first emerges from the beneath the bell, she's actually got the robe over her head. Um, this is partly for dramatic effect in other places like Aoi no Wei, uh, this also happens. She's not coming down from the bell, but when she emerges, she first comes on stage, she's got the, the robe over her head. Um, it's partly for dramatic effect, you have this dramatic reveal, but it's partly also uh, to indicate shame in the demonic appearance. And there's often, it's not in this case, but for example, in Aoi no Wei, she indicates she feels shame in her demonic appearance. This is definitely a strong interpretation with um, orange and uh, reddish, uh, orange and gold triangles on top, even more strongly, ferociously demonic. And here's another version of that you can see with the, uh, with the demon stick. Um, eventually the stay, uh, so we have, <clears throat> you're gonna see the, the ritual, uh, um, uh, um, the exorcism, sorry. Um, and uh, eventually she's driven onto the Hashikakuri bridge by the Waki where she drops her outer robe and then she's forced back as far as the curtain, but then she returns and makes a comeback invading the, invading the stage once again. Um, this captures the moment when the stage begins to gather power to reattack the bell. Um, but eventually um, the, the priests chant the invocation to the five dragon kings, obviously very appropriate um, for uh, exercising the demonic spirit serpent. And she, in the end, she is defeated. Um, indicating by a kneel on the main stage and then again on the Hashikakadi Bridgeway. Um, and the last lines are her body burns in her own fire. She leaps into the river pool, into the waves of he River Hidaka, and there she vanishes. And that leap into the Hidaka River is indicated by a flying leap through this curtain at the end of the Hashikakadi. Or sometimes we get a series of kneels. Um, and in that case, it's it's like almost like she, you can, it's it's an indication of her of her snake-like body going into the river, right? But of course she's going to return. Of course she's going to return. Um, okay, I think that's about it. Um, I just, I, I will put this in the, oh, no, I was going to show you a couple of woodblock prints of the Dojoji story and then we'll quit. Um, let me see where I am on the timing. Yeah, I'm, I'm done, but I'll just show them to you. Um, in the Edo period, we have, they, they, a lot of the woodblock prints like to focus on that moment of transformation into the river. Um, and so this is sort of setting up um, uh, Professor Shimasaki's talk this afternoon. Here she is. Um, notice that her hair is completely disheveled. That she uh, uh, she's got the hands uh, gripping um, and toes gripped as well, which indicates passion um, and passionate anger. That her uh, her obi robe um, comes out like a like a, a snake, right? And she's gazing intently at the boat. Um, this is actually up here is a, a, a very oblique uh, reference to the end of Musume Dojoji, where she's up on top of the, of the bell and the um, temple servants are, are thrown onto their backs. We'll probably see something, some version or talk about that. Um, here's another a lovely Chikonobu uh, uh, print, which makes everything much simpler. I love this empty space on, that she's gazing out to on the left. Now we have a, uh, the boatman prominently, um, prominently uh, featured. With the long, with the obi robe and the um, triangles. Um, oh, also, her left side of her um, shoulder is off, which indicates madness or passionate obsession. It's another thing. Um, and finally, I, I, this is a, another Chikanobu print. Um, she here, she just seems completely exhausted. She's gone to the to the river, and she's like, <gasps> and she's holding on to the the tree for support. Um, again, we see the triangles and disheveled hair, but the boatman seems totally like. <laughs> um, and interestingly, in Kinazai Sadashima Diary, which is this parody version, and everything gets reversed in Kinazai Sadashima Diary. You know, the 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 woman who's attacking the bell turns out to be a man, and and everybody's doubled, and all the gender is all confused. But there's a very and there's also a, a complete reversal. Of the of the boatman scene as well, so it's it's definitely a focus, um, not in Musume Dojoji, but in other versions of the Dojoji story. Okay, I will stop there. Um, again, uh, this is for more information. This is Ginny Scord's um, uh, uh, 
translation of the Dojo Emaki. This is my version of it, where I talk a lot more about the demonic feminine um, and uh, which uh, and less about the actual performance aspects. Um, I actually prefer this version of my text. It's also in, uh, you can also get it in JSTOR um, at the Gen Gen Journal of Japanese Studies, but this I prefer because it's it was the revised version of it. Um, but, and I've got it on academia.edu if you search for me. Okay, that's it, I'm done.